Stanford University. All right, well, welcome, everybody. Thanks for coming out to the first class of what uh, will be hopefully a very exciting and interesting and stimulating experience. We're here to talk about the election. My name is Rob Reich. I teach in the political science department. This course will be co-taught along with Jim Steyer, who's seated at the end of the stage there, and history professor David Kennedy, who regrettably couldn't be with us tonight, but will be here next week. Um, I want to give you a few things just logistically about the class, since this is opening night. But as you can tell, we're not going to spend much time with introduction. We're going to leap right into the substance with some of the guests we've brought today. Today's topic is campaign strategy. What I want to do now is turn the floor over to Jim Steyer, who will say a few words about our roles as moderators and introduce the guests we have tonight. Jim. Okay, great. Thank you, Rob. Great to see you guys. Um, I am totally psyched for this class. I am so glad we are here. And I, I think tonight will be a, despite the Motley crew next to me, I think it will be quite a lineup. Let me, I want to just echo a couple of reasons that Rob and I and David Kennedy, who will be here next week, who actually is going to lead next week's class, being one of the great presidential historians of our time, um, but why we're teaching the class. I think a big reason is that we think this is an absolutely critical election, not just for this country, but for young people and the next generation. I cannot think, it's interesting listening to both President Obama and Governor Romney talk about how critical this is and how, how much they think they're coming from, this is really a decisive moment when you can choose one or the other. But I think if you're a young person today, that these stakes are incredibly high, perhaps even higher for the continuing study students who will be integrated by next week into the audience. We will not have the, the seating arrangement that Rob said. But I think that the stakes are huge for our country, and I think they are particularly huge for young people because we as a society in many cases have ignored a lot of questions that are going to determine your guys' future. And so I think this is going to be an extraordinary opportunity to look at that with some of the smartest, most interesting, and in this case, outspoken people you can imagine. Um, and also good looking, Chris. Thank you very much. You, and actually, I was going to save this for later, but who do you think there's a movie out in which one of our guests is now being portrayed? And you can, I'll, we'll answer the question at the end of the evening. You can write it down. Who portrays Chris Lahane in the movie that is now out? That's a big question for the audience that you'll have to decide since he raised the good looking issue. Um, but back to the substance of the class. Uh, this is going to be a great opportunity. And I think every week we're going to have fascinating speakers with a diversity of opinion. And that is the goal. If we, we're going to try to integrate as much as possible, as Rob said, questions and input from the class. The online nature of the class has changed it a little. And all the Stanford General Counsel rules that Rob has, bless him, negotiated over the last couple of days as they've tried to put restrictions on the class, which we understand. But I think we're going to have amazingly provocative guests. The one thing we really want to say, too, is no matter if you are very conservative, very liberal, no matter where you are in the political spectrum, we are going to be open to your views. We're trying to bring a diversity of opinion, and we will do our best to do that. But we also believe that you, as members of the class, can do that as well. And we want to approach it with both an open and provocative attitude to debating some of the big issues facing our society, not just in this election, but in the next 10 or 20 years, but also with intellectual rigor. And in Pro Professor Gary Segura, who's here tonight, it's one of the leading experts on polling in the United States. So we are going to integrate people who are on the front lines of running national campaigns and building foreign policy and domestic policy with scholars. And I think it's going to be a fascinating class. A, role, a, a comment about Rob's and my role as moderator and David Kennedy, when, he, when Professor Kennedy is here next week, he can, he can speak for himself. And, and no one would speak for David on this. But I can say that because being a prof is not, I've taught here for 25 years. But this is not my only job. I actually have very strong opinions about the issues. My real job is in the field of child advocacy, and that's the field I've worked in in education child advocacy for 25 years. So I have very strong opinions about some of the issues we're going to hear in this class. And while Rob and I are moderators, I feel that, that, that I would like, I, I will, I am sure, inject my own opinions and thoughts into both some of the questions and comments I make. I'm sure about that as well. You Mark is sure about that as well. <laughs> Professor Reich, maybe a slightly more classic academic in that way, being more quest. But, but I just want to say up front that because you have three different professors in the class, that we, that we do feel, in addition to moderating and asking questions, that we will also present our views, because we feel there's going to be a broad enough array of opinions that all good voices will be heard. And obviously, you are free to disagree with any and all things that I say, Rob says, David Kennedy says, 
or our three august panelists say. Our goal is that you learn, <laughs> that, you, that you get engaged, and it's certainly for you students that you get active. That's what I would like to see happen out of this class. You learn, you get engaged, and you get active. So tonight, we're going to talk about where we are in the 2012 campaign. And we have three pretty remarkable guests. We had a fourth, Mike McCurry, who among his many great, who among his many great uh, uh, career accomplishments was the press secretary the, for President Clinton before Mr. Lehane, and uh, who uh, is stu was stuck on a runway at Dulles Airport today. He was flying out just to do our class. And he is going to return on the night of August 20, uh, October 23rd, because he is actually the chairman of the Presidential Debate Commission. So he is going to come here the night after the last presidential debate and discuss his view of the four presidential debates that he's overseen, plus foreign policy, because before being Clinton's spokesperson, he was a spokesperson for the State Department. So tonight, we're going to have three experts on the campaign process. And I'm going to introduce them in order, give them an opening question, and let them take it from there. The first on my right, your left, is Mark McKinnon, uh, who is quite simply, we, we put all these guys' bios on the web, so if you haven't looked them up, please go look them up. Mark's one of the great political uh, and, and, and media experts in the United States. Uh, among his many accomplishments were spearheading Ann Richards' victory as governor of Texas, and then, along with his good friend Karl Rove, being the brain behind the election of George W. Bush in both 2000 and 2004. He's considered across the board to be one of the great political communications experts in the United States. He has a range of interests, ranging from the No Labels organization that he founded. He's on the board of Common Sense Media, the organization I run. And most of all, he's one of the smartest people you'll ever meet when talking about politics. And he always wears a Stetson. <laughs> so that's Mark. And, and I'll, let me do the quick intro, and then I'm going to tell you the question they're going to get. Next to him is Chris Lehane, who, yes, there is a movie out called Knife Fight, which would be a description of Mr. Lehane's career as a political consultant, which has run the gamut from Chris faced off against McKinnon in Bush v. Gore in 2000, when Chris was the spokesperson for Al Gore and the, and the key campaign strategist for Gore in the 2000 election. Maybe they will rerun that election for you tonight. Um, he is also, he, as, he, is, he is one of the great political experts and consultants in the United, this is the last time I'm going to get a chance to say anything today, guys. The le, one of the great political consultants in the country, he and his partner, Mark Fabiani, uh, who were first known as the masters of disaster because they, they handled all of the Monica Lewinsky press in the Clinton White House during, during the mid-1990s. And that is where, and so Chris was a longtime veteran of both the Clinton White House, the Gore campaign. He was originally John Kerry's press secretary until he fired John Kerry as a candidate, <laughs> and is one of the most important political consultants in the country and in the state of California. Um, Gary Segura is a professor here in the political science department at Stanford. He's one of the great experts on polling in the United States. In addition to his duties as a professor at Stanford and his expertise in the area of polling, he also does polling, particularly on issues related to Latinos in the United States, and is employed by both leading companies and nonprofits to examine Hispanic voting patterns and, and quite frankly, polling all across the country. And, and, and as Rob described, is, is very, very, runs a, a program that looks at all the different data that we're going to talk about tonight. My opening question to the three gentlemen, and start with Mark, then Chris, then Gary, and then we're just going to turn it into a discussion of the campaign, is this. The opening question, and this is certainly OK for Mark and Chris, is one, name the, this is their opening, so you can get to know them, is name the <laughs> dumbest thing you ever did running a presidential campaign in the United States. And then second, after you finish telling us the worst mistake you ever made running a presidential campaign, well, how do you think the campaign is going right now? Is sitting here on September 25th, how do you think the campaign is going? And the one thing we are going to do with each of the guests is ask them to make a prediction of who is going to win the presidency, who's going to win the Senate, and who's going to win the House. They're going to be on record tonight. And then the class <laughs> on November 8th, their colleague Steve Schmidt, the also known as the Bullet, who was the campaign manager for John McCain in the 2008 campaign, after Mr. McKinnon left the McCain campaign, 
Steve is going to come and grade them and decide who is the winner from these three gentlemen. They will get a prize from Rob, me, and David Kennedy for the best accurate prediction of the electoral result. So the opening question to Mark, Chris, and Gary is, dumbest thing you ever did on a campaign, followed by, how do you think it's going? And, how do you, and then we'll get to the predictions from each of you. Boy, it's a, it's a long list. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I, I think Chris will say, we, we learn more from our losses and the stupid things that we do than from, from our victories. Uh, I guess probably the dumbest thing that I did was, uh, I was, uh, there was a, uh, a filing, a, 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 a fundraising filing for a, a candidate, and the deadline was quickly coming. It was a very complicated system of different committees that were, were, was far com too complicated for me, A, to understand or B, explain. So ahead of, the, ahead of time, I asked the treasurer of the campaign to, and said, please make sure you're here when we file this report because I need you to explain this to the press because I can't do it. Uh, and, and sure enough, uh, filing day came and he'd left town. And, uh, and so we, it, you know, it was, the press was on deadline. They're all calling me. I'm trying to figure out something to say. And finally, what I get quoted on and saying in the lead paragraph of the New York Times is, it's not as bad as it looks. <laughs> and uh, and I, I got a call as soon as the, you know, it was, it was like 5 a.m. and the phone rang and I knew it was, it was the candidate. And he called and he said, God damn it, McKenna and I can get people to say that about me for free. <laughs> uh, so uh, the, the campaign today, where it stands, it's, 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 it's so fascinating, uh, our politics, and, and that's why we do it, because it's, A, it's, it's often, we often throw conventional wisdom out the door. We try and predict these things, but our predictions are always based on what I'd call pattern recognition. It's just things that have happened before that we assume, because of the patterns, will happen again. And it's, we have a very limited history, really. You know, I think of all the times of things that people said things wouldn't happen, like electing a black president. You know, and then you elect a black president. Uh, so it's it's a fun to be a part of and uh, and and to try and predict what's going to happen. But just to give you an idea of the strategic framework in 2000 when we ran, uh, the conventional wisdom was that uh, the Democrats were in good, fairly good position. People felt pretty good about the direction of the of the country, and so and most academics and pundits predicted that Al Gore was going to win that election for a variety of conventional wisdom metrics. You ask people. Uh, what issues they cared about. It was health care, social security, and education. And you asked which party did a better job on that. It was Democrats by 10 points or more. So it looked like a good environment for Democrats. So we were in the position of being sort of the challenger because an incumbent party. So the strategic framework in that election was we were trying to argue things are great, so it's time for a change. An odd kind of strategic setup. Uh, but certain dynamics happened that we'll, maybe we'll talk about a little bit later. Flash forward four years in 2004. Now we're the incumbent president. Things are pretty screwed up. The economy's not in good shape. We're in foreign conflicts. And now we're in the strategic box of just the opposite, where we're saying things are kind of screwed up. Stay the course. <laughs> and so, uh, but, but this election, from the very beginning, has reminded me so much of 2004, um, where we had uh, you know, a situation where less than 50% of the country liked President Bush, less than 50% liked his policies. Less than 50% thought the country was headed in the right direction. And yet, through the dynamics of the campaign, a lot of which had to do with our opponent, we were able to win that election. And so as I, as I see this election, you know, this was almost impossible given the conventional wisdom. And, you, and we can go through these numbers. Nobody's ever lost an election except for 50 years ago uh, when, when FDR ran, when the employment rate was, what, above 8%. Above there's all these things where you could look at and say there's no way Obama could win this election. You could put up any Republican candidate and win in this election. And yet, here we are, and, uh, uh, and we'll, 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 <laughs> uh, the, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll hear the numbers in a minute. And now it almost looks impossible for, for Romney to win, uh, which is pretty amazing when you think about it. So, w w so the state of the race, I think, I'll, my only caveat is that I remember very well in 2000, Chris, when you guys had a great convention, stepped on our bounds. Suddenly, you were up three. We called it Black September, rats, moles, and bad poles. And everybody said we should be fired. The ads were horrible. You know, so it's very similar. I've, I've heard this. I've, I've seen this movie before. Uh, 
So the external events can impose themselves. There could be you know, a meltdown in the Middle East. Romney could have a great debate performance. Things happen. So uh, that's kind of my view of the state of the race. OK. You want me to go next? Yeah, why okay. don't you go okay. next, Chris? And we'll, later, we're going to come back and make, we're going to nail them down very, very specific <laughs> numerical predictions <laughs> that we'll revisit on November 8th. Uh, well, thank you for, for having me here today. Um, uh, uh, this, this may age you a little bit, but my wife had Professor Steyer That's as a professor true. in a That's similar true. class at some point in the not too distant past, right? Correct. Uh, and Rob, thank, <laughs> Rob, thanks for having me back. Uh, I, I didn't realize this was also a combined law school sort of you know, multi-course approach, so I, I like the, the law tutorial at the beginning. I feel much more. And, and, and for the record, I will just state that I am pro-integration, and I hope in the next class that we get some mixture. <laughs> I, will, I will stand by that statement. Um, you know, the, 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 dumbest, the dumbest thing I may have done in a campaign may be actually answering that question about the dumbest thing I've ever done. <laughs> but um, uh, at, at somewhat of a serious level, um, I, I think the dumbest thing without naming specific names that I have done in a political campaign um, is made a decision to work for a campaign or a candidate uh, because I thought that they were most likely to win, uh, as opposed to making a decision to work for someone or get involved with someone because I believed in what they stood for and I believed in, in their candidacy uh, and them as a person. Uh, and that's something that I often get asked about, particularly from a younger crowd, about how do you make decisions of who you work for. Uh, and so for whatever that's worth, I would just pass on, um, you know, if you're looking at getting involved in a campaign or working for someone, uh, don't pick someone because you think that they're going to win or they're in the best position. Pick someone because you believe in them. Um, in terms of where I see this race, um, I, I think maybe six or seven months ago, the Obama campaign, I think, did something that has to be very, is going to go down in the annals of, of campaign history as being one of the most brilliant uh, uh, strategic decisions ever, is they obviously had to have inserted a sleeper agent into the Romney campaign <laughs> to run the Romney campaign on a day-to-day -day basis, uh, given the fact that everything that, that, that Mark has said uh, is 100% is right. If you look at all the underlying data out there uh, and the historical data, you know, this is a race where the Republicans should be able to have nominated a refrigerator, and a refrigerator would be ahead you know, at this point in time. Um, I, I guess you know, if you go, and, and at some level, you look at, at, at what the Romney campaign is doing, and it's almost as if they sort of believe they're running for president in South Carolina. Right? You win the primary, and the campaign is over. I mean, that, that is effectively the type of campaign that they've run uh, from beginning to end. And I think, you know, at, at the core of it, modern presidential campaigns come down essentially to a massive character test, a character compare and contrast. And at the center of that is the issue of trust. Uh, and, I think the Obama, and I think the 2004 analogy is, is very apt, because I think in 2004, the Bush campaign, in large part because of Mark's uh, contributions, understood it was an issue of trust. Uh, and every day they got up and ran a campaign that was designed to make people feel better about then-President Bush on the trust issue and have concerns about Senator Kerry on trust issues. I think the Obama campaign has taken a very similar approach, which is every day they get up and they want to raise questions about trust. And when this campaign you know, began in earnest, uh, because of where the economy was and because he is the incumbent, the burden of proof at some level was on the president. He has effectively shifted that burden of proof, particularly on the trust issue, onto the Romney campaign and to Romney himself. And thus far, uh, you know, Romney has not been able to meet that burden of proof. And you, know, you see it day in and day out, whether it's not putting out the tax returns, whether it's the 13 or 14% answer, whether it's the 47% answer. I mean, he's had a bunch of percentages out there. None of them are still going to get you over 50% because they all ultimately go to raising concerns uh, about the trust issue. Um, and so I really think as you look at, you know, we are, I think, 1,000 hours left in the campaign or maybe a little bit less uh, as of tonight, um, you know, uh, the Romney's last best shot absent some major external event is going to be that debate. And, and the debates have had an impact. In 2000, as, as Mark indicated, Al Gore was up anywhere between three and five points, depending on which polls you believed, and sort of on a good trajectory, uh, and had a debate performance that really reinverted the campaign at that point. Um, in 2004, I think Bush was on a very strong path, didn't have the strongest debate performance in the first debate. That race got tight again all of a sudden. So I do think that there is a pattern out there where these debates have allowed for a realignment. Um, but I do think that that is the last best chance that Romney has to fundamentally change where this election is going. Other than that, um, you know, I think that, that, uh, that the president has decisively run this trust argument, understands that this is a character up and down contest, and is running a campaign designed to take advantage of that. 
Great. Well, let's turn to Gary, so you don't have a story to tell from inside a campaign about the worst thing you've ever done. I've never run a presidential campaign, so I've never done anything wrong <laughs> under this. <circumstances. laughs> I'm a pollster, just a pollster. And, and actually, I do have a story of a polling mistake I made, because it's going to come up in just a minute, which is for a, a very small client earlier this year who had no money. We tried to do something for this client to see if we could get an answer to the question he needed answered. And so we attempted to do IVR polling or robo polling of Hispanics in both languages. You it might was, explain what robo calling is. A robo calling is when you get interviewed for a survey, not by a live caller, but by when the phone rings, a voice gives you the first question and you touch one for yes and two for no, et cetera. Um, Turns out Latinos don't really do that. Uh, the, first night, the first night, we made 4,600 telephone calls and got four complete. <laughs> That's actually going to be relevant in a minute, so, so hold, hold that thought. We ended up completing the thing by telephone and losing money, but, uh, which is really bad. Um, OK, so I'm going to talk about the campaign with a little political science thrown in. I don't disagree with anything that's said so far. Uh, I think I would phrase it a little bit more clearly. President Obama is going to be reelected in November. The victory train has left the station, and nobody sold Mitt Romney a ticket. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> by the way, that doesn't necessarily mean that President Obama should be reelected. And I'm not talking about your particular political positions. I'm talking about you know, the, the way the administration has uh, engaged the political process through his term and the way the campaign has been run. I think it has been a good campaign, but not a great campaign. Uh, maybe my colleagues will disagree with me up here, but, but I think that, that his opponent has run a tragic campaign. And so barring, barring a crisis or a, a big inversion in the debates, as, as um, uh, as these folks have talked about, I don't see a change coming. And actually, the literature in political science suggests that if there's an international crisis, for example, if Israel were to bomb Iranian nuclear sites, that that actually benefits the incumbent party historically. Uh, people rally around the president, even if three months later they're unhappy with his policy, in the immediate offing, International conflict helps the incumbent administration. And in terms of the debates, there's very little evidence that debates have ever really changed minds. I don't care who you're voting for, but hold your hand up if you strongly support either President Obama or Governor Romney. Hold them up. OK, now keep them up if there's anything the other candidate could say in a debate to persuade you. Uh-oh. So that's the thing. And, and there's like one person. And who's watching? Who's watching those debates? Well, there's folks like you. Uh, but the vast majority of America will not watch the debates. They will do things like you know, work on Junior's homework and give the baby a bath, because that's, frankly, more important to them. So, so there's not, I just don't see a lot of change coming. Um, I wanted to talk about the polling briefly. Um, this has been a remarkable election, if for no other reason than the polls have been unbelievably stable. The president has never jumped out to a very large lead. And I, there might have been one day in May and one day in midsummer where the statistical average of the polling dropped to close to zero, but he's never been behind. Governor Romney has never led. Um, now, here's the, the polling notion. Polling varies dramatically in quality. And if you looked at the polling averages right now, the polling averages of all the major national polls suggest that the president's ahead by approximately four percentage points. If you take out Rasmussen and Gallup, for different reasons, you get a much bigger spread. You're talking about the president by five and a half or six percentage points. Now, why this is going to sound partisan. I don't know the person individually, and maybe you guys do. Why anyone believes anything Scott Rasmussen publishes is completely beyond me. <laughs> At one point, every poll in America had Obama up by four, and Rasmussen had Romney up by three. I, first of all, you just when you mail that number out to the press, don't you sort of look at it and go, hmm. Um, so, so the reason these polls vary is because they use different methods. They, they, some are robo polls, like I described to you before. Some use live callers. We get much lower compliance in robo polls. Not, not as many people answer. So the non-response bias is much bigger. 
Robopoles are never, ever, ever translated into Spanish. Keep in mind that Hispanics are about 9.5% of the electorate this year, and about one in three of them speak Spanish as a first language and would prefer to answer in Spanish. What that means is that about 3% of the electorate is not represented in any poll, and they break two to one Democratic. Um, so any poll that's not translated and done in Spanish, and by the way, that excludes all of the robopolls. Uh, calling cell phones. Uh, many of you live on your cell phone. It's increasingly common that Americans live without a house phone. If the sample does not include cell phones, they're missing a lot of younger people and a lot of more technologically savvy people and a lot of people who are in what we call early adopters, people who just decided to, to ditch their home phone early. That's a, that's a distorting number. So lesson number one is not all polls are equally reliable. Now the swing state polling looks even better for the president than the national polling does. In fact, I went and looked back at the last two weeks of polling for in each of the swing states, and this is like 50 different polls on 10 different swing states, and I could find one poll that favored Governor Romney in North Carolina. Every other poll, including other polls in North Carolina, has the president ahead in every swing state. Um, I would suggest to you that that's an insurmountable lead uh, that, that Governor Romney just doesn't have a prayer of overcoming. However, the Romney campaign, especially today, has been pushing back. And their argument is, all the public polls are wrong. <clears throat> Lesson number two, when a candidate says all the polls are wrong, they're going to lose. <laughs> now, <laughs> now and, and I, think, I, think, I think these guys up here who, who know this business better than I do would agree with me that a poll is frequently wrong, but all the polls are almost never wrong. Uh, you, you just, you've interviewed way too many people for that to be the case. Um, so the question is Can why... I, I mean, there's yeah. just one point on that. I mean, the, the rationale, whether you agree with it or not, is that the, the other factor that you, you haven't really touched on is that polling is based on a turnout model. So yeah. everybody's basing their numbers on a turnout model. Now, I don't know what the, most of them are basing on, but some of them, I mean, with Romney's campaign and Dick Morris was saying, <laughs> I know, I know. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I'm, just, I'm just explaining what they're saying, is that, that a lot of these polls are, are making a prediction based on a 2008 model, on a model, and that that was a heavily Democratic turnout, and that there won't be that Democratic kind of enthusiasm for turnout, and therefore the numbers will be different. That's they don't just, believe you guys, they don't believe young people will turn out. But, the, but, but, but there's an empirical question here, which is, what is the likely voter screen being used? And of course, we could just simply ask them. Yeah. I mean, it's not like it's, it's, not like it's hard. But that's not what the Romney camp is going to do. So, so with all due respect, don't believe anything they're saying about, about polls, because I, I don't think the polls are wrong. Um, so why? Why, is, why with 8.3% unemployment, is Governor Romney so, so uh, disadvantaged? The first, I, I would identify two reasons, one of which I think is fairly obvious, which is that the, the primary season had a weak set of candidates, and uh, at the same time, the extreme, uh, or the more uh, extreme wing of the party has kind of taken control of the GOP, and it pushed Mitt Romney very much further to the right than his political career has thus far uh, been conducted. And that has made it difficult for him he was severely handicapped with the middle of the road voter at the start of the election. But the second reason, and I think this echoes uh, some of the thoughts that have already been um, uh, indicated, is that the Romney campaign is a train wreck. Um, now, I, I, here's a question I have for my colleagues, and I'm, I'm going to be very interested to hear how they answer this. Campaigns can be train wrecks for two reasons. One is that they can be poorly managed. And the second is that they have a good manager that the candidate doesn't listen to, that candidates micromanage campaigns. And I'll let these guys uh, respond to whether or not they think that's happening here. But messaging is a train wreck. It is approaching October 1st. There is still not a unifying theme in the Romney campaign. How do you really feel about this? <laughs> well, let me finish, and you guys can shoot it all down. Um, the vice presidential pick. The vice presidential pick did a good job energizing voters that all of the polls prior to his selection indicated were already going to turn out and vote for Romney in large numbers. Um, the convention was a missed Miss Clint Eastwood, enough said. Um, I was waiting for the empty chair. Th there's, 
there's almost no policy content in the Romney campaign, and I thought of the perfect term for Mitt Romney's candidacy. He is the anti-Clinton. So Bill Clinton is famous for, for speaking for 10 minutes and giving you 12 concrete policy proposals. Mitt Romney can speak for 10 minutes and not articulate one. Like, there's no actual proposal. And I think that that's really handicapping him because, of course, the press has been on him and, and his opponent has been on him. There's also been some sort of weird, weird stagecraft. Like, in one particular episode in, in something I follow, Romney introduced his Hispanic outreach team and there was this big event, and all the, the, the regional directors were there, and, and the woman who was running the, the Hispanic outreach for the Romney campaign was there. And she was asked a question about how they plan to overcome Governor Romney's immigration position. And she said, well, the governor hasn't arrived at a firm immigration position, which the campaign had to walk back 15 minutes later, because of course they had. Um, it was just, I mean, it was supposed to be a big sort of reset for outreach to Hispanics, and it, and it was a train wreck. Um, and we could go on and on and on, uh, but, but the point is I think it's a poorly run campaign. I only have one more thing to, to say, and, and that is that in political science we have a theory in international relations called gambling for resurrection. And the theory of gambling for resurrection is imagine you're a tin pot dictator <laughs> and the NATO troops are approaching your capital. Bad stuff's about to happen to you. Now you can either try to flee or go down in flames with your regime, or you can take, get on the crazy train. You can launch scuds at Tel Aviv, okay? So put Mitt Romney in this position. He's gonna lose. There's that unless the dynamic changes significantly, he's going to lose. He needs to upset the race. How he does that, I don't know but it would certainly be in his interest to throw a grenade into the dynamics of the race, either by coming out with some significant charge against the president in terms of policy, like you know, after the election, the president's gonna abandon Israel, or after the election, the president's gonna, who knows what it is, but, but he needs to upset the equilibrium because if he stays on the current path, he's gonna lose. So Rob, questions for, let's, let's go Chris, and, and Mark. Well, so why don't, we, why don't we try and get you on the record now about then, an electoral college? And then I want you guys to analyze the yeah. campaign because Mark, you should know, Mark schooled Stu Spencer, the guy who's running the Stevens. Romney campaign. He used yeah, to work right. for Mark. So you want? <laughs> <laughs> Correct. So we worked together on some campaigns. Okay. So. I'll put that in the same category as my wife having been taught by Jim. So you. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, so Chris, let me start with you. Are you willing to go on record with an electoral college prediction? Uh, yes, uh, I, I think, uh, and I'm not going to do the math in my head, but I would take the Obama states that he won uh, in 2008, uh, less Indiana, and I'll say less the Tar Hill state, mm -hmm. um, and uh, and say that that's where he ends up, you know, based on where we stand right that's now. That's 332. Thank you very much. That's, that's ex excellent. <laughs> Mark, what do you think? <laughs> but, but, but let me finish. But I, but I also think that the margin will not be as anywhere near as big, obviously, as 2000. I actually think the margin will be quite tight because I think the president really has a hard ceiling yeah. based on where the economy is of you know a little bit over 50 percent. But even with that little bit over 50 percent, given where these swing states are and given um, you know the electoral votes counted there, he can end up with a significant electoral college win, but a narrow uh, you know margin in terms of the percentage. Right. Mark? Uh, you know, I'm just trying to think of best case scenario at this point, a, a probable best case scenario, and, and I just have to, I have to ask my electoral calculator over <laughs> here to help me out. Well, I mean, so, let's, so, let's say that Romney takes Ohio. I know it's eight down today. <laughs> I'll have to look that one up. <laughs> That's 20. And, 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 and let's say he, he's, he manages to keep Florida as well. Ohio and Florida, yeah. but what about uh, North Carolina and, and Indiana and Virginia? Loses Virginia, wins North Carolina, wins Indiana. Okay, so that would give Romney 39, 47. Loses Colorado, loses 57, New Mexico, Mexico Nevada. 62. Nevada. That gives Romney 253 electoral votes. He still doesn't win. I think win. that's best case scenario. <laughs> Right now. 
So let, actually, let me let me follow. That's good. And here's McCurry, McCurry said, just so you should know, because Mike's going to be here on the 23rd. So Mike said that he he thinks Romney wins re-election with 51 percent of the vote, 309 electoral votes. I give him Colorado, Iowa, Florida, New Hampshire, Ohio, New Mexico, Pennsylvania, and Michigan. Wait, wait. Among... You say he says Romney's going to win? No, no. Oh. Obama wins. Yeah. 309. You said you said Romney. No. Maybe I was just yes. You know I'm rooting for Romney, so it's like that. <laughs> Romney finishes with 48% and gets 229 electoral votes. He gets Arizona, Arizona, Wisconsin, uh, Virginia, and Missouri. So let me ask do you. I get to, do I get to? Yeah, well, yeah, 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 yeah. He's the expert. Yeah, yeah. Well, you've already said the train left the station. And <laughs> but I didn't say by how much. <laughs> <laughs> how many cars are going to cross How many, how many the cars make it? <laughs> I'll say, I'm, I'm, I'm going to say North Carolina goes to, uh, Indiana's a loss, but I'll say 347 electoral votes for the president. I'll say 52% of the two-party vote. I'll say the Democrats do not take the House of Representatives, but the Republicans get less than 225 seats. So they get a majority, but no more than 225. And the Dems hold the Senate with 52. Uh, I'll also add in the Giants beat Texas in game seven of the World Series. <laughs> <laughs> And Stanford wins the national championship <laughs> in football. Why not? Why not? Anyone, anyone associated with Stanford knows hard. that when USC lost to Stanford, the Super Bowl. our year was done. <laughs> so I actually want to ask Mark questions because I was teasing him. You, what is the, let's talk a little about this, because we are going to talk about the congressional stuff and about what's going on. And we really want to talk about the super PACs and what happened with Citizens United, because you guys understand all of it. But I actually, because I was teasing Mark about Stu Spencer, Mark is actually if you think about this, and these guys know it better, these two know it better than anybody, to win with Bush in 2000, when you had peace and a surplus and a good economy, and to convince them to switch horses is an amazing political victory. If you just think about it, given the debt. What do you think that Jim Messina, that's the campaign manager for Obama, Jim Messina, David Plouffe, who is running the campaign out of the White House, and those, Gaspard, all the guys who run it for Obama, what do you think they've done that's really worked here? Because we've sort of heard criticism of the Romney campaign, but what do you think they've done that's been really, really smart in the way they've run the campaign? And what has Obama done as a candidate that's really made a difference? First, Mark. Well, uh, I, one thing I think that they did that was smart was uh, they spent early heavily. I mean, they spent heavily early. Uh, they, they did a lot of wet work mm -hmm. uh, in the summer. In, target, in targeted states, they, you know, they, they, uh, it was a furious assault early on, and there was some part of the Romney strategy that suggested that they have and are counting on big money late, which I think is, uh, is, is a misplaced strategy because I think that uh, sort of post-September, everything becomes white noise in terms of the advertising, people are tuning it out. So I think the return on investment after Labor Day and the conventions is minimal. So I think that that advantage, if Romney actually has it, and there's some question about that at this point now too, I don't think it's gonna be the, 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 the I don't think it's gonna be as, uh, as effective uh, as they thought it might be in the beginning. So I think the spend early strategy was smart on part of Obama. Anything else in particular, anything that, Obama himself has done, or anything else that you look at the campaign and go, oh, that was very well done. You know, I, I, I think as I, as I look at it, it's, you know, I, I don't think either campaign has been particularly bold. And I, and I think that's been more problematic for Romney. Uh, but, uh, you know, I think that the, the Obama campaign in many ways has been playing not to lose. I mean, they haven't been particularly risky or bold either, but, it, but given the way that Romney's run the campaign, that's turned out to be a smart strategy. Okay, by the way, one fact you should know about Mark, in his office in Austin, Texas, there's a great note from Barack Obama. Because after the, after the Republican primary in 2008, Mark dropped out of the McCain campaign because? Well, uh, I, 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 It's really I, interesting. Uh, just, okay. Tell him. Um. <laughs> <laughs> it's an unique in American political annals of the last 20 years. Well, I, uh, I had, I, I had known John McCain and worked for John. I mean, uh, I worked uh, in in Republican politics with John McCain. Had great respect for him. wasn't particularly interested in doing another presidential campaign, but said that 
uh, given the sacrifices that he'd made for, for his country that if, and, and uh, the honor that he sort of shared through his work that I, if I could ever do anything for him, I would. And he asked me to do his presidential campaign. And I said I'd, I'd help kind of set up the advertising team. And then the campaign melted down. They all quit. And I ended up having to run the whole thing But uh, for the primary. But at the, at, when I joined the campaign, I had, I had spent a little bit of time with Barack Obama, met him, read his books. And I liked him. And, and I, I disagreed with him politically. But I thought his candidacy would be good for the country. And so when I joined the McCain campaign, I wrote a memo the day that I joined. And I gave it to uh, the senator and the the, the senior staff, and, it, and I just said, listen, it's, I'm honored to have this opportunity to, to work for the senator. We'll do all I can to get him elected in the primary. But if in the you know, uh, odd circumstances, which were you know, nobody predicted back then that this was going to happen, but I said, if this guy, Barack Obama, wins the Democratic primary, uh, I, I would feel obligated to, to, to step out of the general election, A, because uh, uh, for the, for the reasons that I just mentioned, but I also said I, I don't think I'd be good for the campaign, for your campaign, because you don't want a guy who's supposed to be your sort of trigger man, with you know who's you know who's got a soft trigger, <laughs> and uh, uh, and you know somebody that was just conflicted about it because I thought it was an historic candidacy, and as I said, I thought it'd be good for the country, and I just didn't want to be the guy out there attacking Barack Obama. So I, and then flash forward a year and a half later, everybody had forgotten about the memo. <laughs> Obama gets nominated. I have to walk in and say, uh, Senator, you remember that memo? And he's like, no. Oh. And, uh, <laughs> and he was very gracious about it. It couldn't have been. And it was very hard for me to do at that point because, as you know, this is Blood Brothers you've been through, Band of Brothers. You've been, you know, spent a lot of blood, sweat, and tears. And it's very hard to walk. It was the hardest thing I've ever had to do. But McCain was ver terrific and said it would be very unmccain like to not honor your word. And I love you for getting me here. And God bless you. So that's, that's how it happened. Anyway, Chris, your take on that is pretty, pretty amazing story. He also has in his office the voting booth from Palm Beach County in 2000 <laughs> with a hanging chat, just in case you think everything's wonderful in his office. <laughs> Chris, what's your take on this whole, how they run this? Because we're about to get into the Congress, and we really, mm -hmm. Rob, and I really want to talk about what's happened with the super PACs and the way this whole political reform, what, hap what does this all say about where we are politically? But, how would you look at the way the Obama, you know the Obama guys really well, Chris. You've worked with these guys. What, how do you think they've run the campaign? You know, I, look, I would echo a lot of what, what Mark said and what I said earlier, which is I think from early on, you know, they had a very clear understanding of what a presidential campaign is about. Uh, I think they understood that it's a character test, and they've run a campaign, you know, designed. And look, the president started off with, you know, this, even when he was down in the polls in terms of his favorability and job approval, you know, he's always maintained a high level of personal likability with the electorate and a very high level of trust. Uh, and there was always a dissonance, even when he was at his lowest in terms of job performance, right direction, wrong direction, favorability, in terms of how people viewed him from a trust perspective. And so they started off with that, recognizing that as a significant pillar of their candidacy, but also recognizing that a presidential campaign, assuming it's going to be competitive, is ultimately going to come down to this trust issue. And they run their campaign from the very beginning, I think they were absolutely right to go out and define early uh, and, and put Romney on the defensive. Um, but I also think, and you, know, you raised this, you touched on it, um, that you know, the Romney campaign you know, doesn't seem to understand that that's what this campaign is about, hasn't run a campaign with any recognition that they bear a burden to meet that trust issue. Uh, and I think the Obama campaign has taken full advantage of it. Now, on, on the one thing in terms of uh, of, of the lack of bold ideas or, or, or big vision. Yeah. I mean, I, I would agree with it, but with, with the following sort of qualification or, or, or codicil to that, which is um, I think the Obama folks know, based on the data that they've seen, that they're in a sort of interesting position. And you saw this with the president's speech, I think, at the convention, which is if he goes big and bold and talks about the audacity of hope and becomes aspirational again, that worked great in 2008. But ironically, because I think there have been some shortcomings in their communications as president, it's difficult for him to do that and not risk jeopardizing that very trust issue that they need to win the campaign on. So people saw him at the convention, and I think a number of folks said, oh, he gave a solid speech, but it wasn't what we expected. Yep. Uh, he did it in the last three minutes. You sort of saw the, the Barack of 2008 at the end of that speech. But he purposely dialed it down, because he absolutely knows that if he lifts it up, while it would have played great in the room, it may have played great in the short term with the media, the long term consequences is that it would have raised questions with the voter as well. You know, are we getting promises again that may not necessarily 
be met, regardless of whether that's a fair view or not. Uh, and so I think that they have been hamstrung a little, or at least you know, handcuffed a little bit in their ability to go big, because I think they recognize that that potentially imperils the very trust issue that they're currently winning on. I think that's a great point. Just two quick things. Uh, when we're running presidential elections, people don't <clears throat> vote for presidents on single issues. They vote on a saying. constellation of attributes that Chris has alluded to. And, and during the campaigns that we did in 2000 2004, there were three primarily that we looked at. In, uh, and uh, the most important was the perception of being a strong leader, uh, <clears throat> followed closely by uh, trust and shares your values. So those are the three things that voters are really looking at broadly. And you think about what the president has been doing to shore up those attributes and how Mitt Romney has failed to really communicate in a meaningful way uh, any of those three that, that, that's been able to convince a majority of voters to trust him, that he shares their values, or that he's a strong leader. And to your point earlier, uh, you're exactly right. And the thing that, that I ultimately, I, I think, is my observation, I've been trying to figure out Mitt Romney now for, well, for, for a lot, forever. Uh, for, well, well, I was going to say two years, but it actually goes back to the 2008 campaign, too, when I was trying to figure him out then. I think in his heart, he's a, a very decent man. You look at the charitable stuff that he's done. You know, there's that line about you know, true test of character is what you do when nobody else is watching. He's done amazing things quietly and privately. I think he's a good and decent person. I think, that, I think in reality, he's more like his father and more like he was as governor. I think that's who he really is. But somewhere along the way, and he's a, I mean, he, he lived in a business that was transactional. And I think he got into a transactional frame of mind about how he can win a Republican primary. And there were certain things he had to do, which he did, to win that weren't really him. I don't think it reflected his soul or his vision or his ideology, really. And so the tape that came out the other day, I think that was an example of him saying things that he thought conservative audiences wanted to hear him say. You know, And that's why it doesn't, A, it's not true, B, it doesn't sound compassionate, and B, it's, and C, and perhaps most importantly, this is another thing we talk a lot about, it's not authentic. Yeah. So I, I think that's kind of a combination of the problems as well. Yeah, and I, I would just add to that uh, on the Romney side, right? If you, and, and I think everything that Mark said, particularly on those character attributes that as sort of as, that taken together are what folks look for, right? It, it, there's three ways you sort of project your character, particularly if you're running as a challenger. One is through your personal story, right? Romney, and I think at some level, potentially because of his religious background, Correct. particularly in the Republican primary, felt very constrained about being able to talk about some of the things, in particular the charity, which certainly would have been a signifier of his personal character. But that very rarely was talked about or came out. The second you know, way to talk about it is what you've done in your professional career. right? And again, you know, I think that there was probably an opportunity early on to turn his professional ex expertise and experience into a positive. Talk about creating businesses, talk about creating jobs, right? But by trying to sort of pretend like Bain was in the witness protection program, right? He created issues with that, right? And never got a chance to define that until his, his professional career. And then the third element of, of how you sort of define character is by picking some specific policies that are signifiers to what you believe in, right? The policies in and of themselves may not necessarily be the one that's polling the best or be the one that's the most important issue to the public. But picking some issues that tell people something about who you are as a person, the values you have, the type of leader that you will be. Uh, and I think on all three of those, you know, he really has not done the types of things that you would do to sort of fill in who you are as a person, as a character. And I think that's one of the big reasons why, despite the fact that every single economic indicia out there would suggest he should be ahead, he isn't. Maybe we can. Do you, you want to add something? Yeah. 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 No, I did. I do. I wanted to add a, a kind of completely different dimension. I, though I don't disagree with what either of you have said, which is that the Obama campaign has done something that in, that they half stumbled into and 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 half uh, did intentionally, which is they they were eventually persuaded by changing poll numbers on a number of social issues that they could actually take some steps to reinvigorate their base. And in so doing, they got the, the Romney campaign to swing at really bad pitches. Every day that Romney wasn't talking about unemployment was a bad day for Mitt Romney. Well, he got Romney talking about immigration. He got Romney talking about transvaginal ultrasounds. He got Romney talking about, um, talking about a, a same-sex marriage. He got, so the, the Republicans have really tried to stay away 
from those social issues this year because the polling doesn't favor them in the way that it once did. But I thought this is where the, and by the way, Obama was brought, brought kicking and screaming to some of those things. But what the campaign has done of its own volition is every quirk of every Republican in the House of Representatives or in state level government has been hung on the Romney campaign. Whether it's the, the rape thing in Missouri or the ultrasound things in the, in the anti-abortion states or it doesn't matter what sort of socially wacky thing someone is saying, they're hanging the Romney campaign with it and the Romney campaign feels the need to respond and every day they're not talking about uh, unemployment is a bad day for them. Let me say one thing that, that, I, that I see this to pick up on something with Mark and then Robbie, I know you want to shift it and I, I think that, that we should. It goes, Mark just said it, but I think it goes back to what Chris said about how he chooses who to work for. Oh, I wanted to, yes. Because I, I think that's that. an unbelievable, and I say that to you guys, because many of you are going to get involved in issues or campaigns or whatever for the rest of your lives <laughs> and careers, I hope. You know, I think what's really, I, I have a number of colleagues who know Mitt Romney very well. Remember, he built Bain. He was the head of Bain before he started Bain Capital. One of my law school classmates started Bain Capital with him. The, we have a, no, a number of friends and colleagues here in the Bay Area who know Mitt Romney very well, and they like him a lot. They think he's a very smart business guy. You couldn't run Bain and Bain Capital if you weren't a really smart, competent business guy, period, <clears throat> full stop, end of story. I think the thing that, 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 that goes to the transactional thing, and Joe Scarborough, Mark has spent a lot of time on Morning Joe, Joe Scarborough being the, the, the host of one of the top morning political talk shows. He There's said no he's transactional, but he also said that he's just ambitious. So he never really defined why he wanted to be president. He just wanted to be president. And I think that's a real thing that, 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 that you guys were all saying in a way too. He's such a successful guy, but he's never really said why he wanted to be president in, with, with a sense, and I, and other than that it was his next stage in life that he should be. He was the governor, he was the head of Maine, Maine Capital, governor, then president. And I think that goes to the transactional thing. Because on one level or another, you have a sense of why Barack Obama wanted to be the president. And you actually, with George W. Bush, had a sense of why he wanted to be president. And you did with John Kerry. And you did with Bill Clinton, certainly. And I think that's a challenge. But I think it's a point to everybody that ultimately your authenticity is who you are. And I know Mark, when we'll talk about me, Mark as a media specialist, he'll always say, just Jim, be who you are. Don't try to pretend you're anything that you can't be. Because we're all who we are. And I think in terms of... In a, in a campaign where there's that much scrutiny and that much media and that much 24-7, it's a message to all of us and however you lead your life into students. You ultimately are who you are and you have to own who you are. You can grow, you can renew, but you are who you are. And I think if Romney was, came out and really was who he was, he'd be a more effective candidate. Yeah, uh, exactly. And you put your finger on the most important thing of all <clears throat> for anybody running for, for president or any office or any business. It's, it's all about rationale, a clear, compelling rationale. And you know, you you think it's something that's so obvious, uh, and and we talk about this all the time. And there's the famous example of Ted Kennedy on 60 Minutes, getting asked that question in an interview uh, about why he wanted to run for president, and and failing utterly uh, to uh, articulate a rationale about why he wanted to run against Jimmy Carter. In fact, what he articulated was a good reason to reelect Jimmy Carter. Um, uh, and yet you think about Mitt Romney, and there really is that sort of fundamental lack of a clear rationale. I don't think that people really understand why he wants to be president. Uh, I, I wanted to just pick up on you, what you said about uh, candidates and the importance of, of working for people for the right reason. I had a similar experience just in that in the first sort of part of my political career, I thought that the way, uh, first of all, I got into it because I was passionate and, about politics. and. So what I did was I'd, I'd have sort of the things that I believed in, and I had my sort of little litmus test of important issues. And say, say there were 10, and I'd see, you know, there'd be a multi-candidate field, and I'd find the one that lined up most neatly. You know, who, who had nine out of 10 of the things that I'd checked on my list? And what I discovered over time is that quite often I'd find a candidate who matched up nine out of 10 or 10 out of 10, but were miserable human <laughs> beings, you know, that had horrible ethical problems, whatever it might be. And that ultimately, that I learned that character is much more important. Now, you can, we can talk a lot about what does character yeah. mean, and I think people have different evaluations of that, but I certainly came to, to believe, and I, and I think that a lot of voters have the same sort of dynamic going on when they're thinking about voting for president as well. Can I, can I give a, a contrary question, though, and not to swim upstream a little bit? 
yeah, Mitt Romney should be who, who he is. And maybe if he was more authentic, he'd be doing better in the general election. Is the true Mitt Romney nominatable well, that, in the Republican well, Party? That, I, I don't think so. <laughs> and I think that's why he became somebody else. All right, so I want to try shifting the grounds of the conversation just a bit to issues of campaign finance and the role of money in politics. So one of the things uh, which both of you have touched upon is the, you know, the, the transactional nature of campaigning. And certainly my sense is, uh, not from the inside, but from the inside of a campaign, um, things are somewhat different in 2012 than they were just four years ago in light of the Citizens United decision, which unleashed um, unlimited amounts of money that could be raised, not given directly to a campaign, but to an advocacy group that in theory can't coordinate with campaigns, but in practice seem to be quite closely aligned. So I'm wondering now what it means first for, from your perspective within a campaign, how now you manage a, cam, you know, a candidate's electoral strategy when some very significant proportion of the money that ostensibly is on your side is not really under your control and you've got all these other dollars that are uh, awash in the super PACs which can be deployed on your behalf or perhaps not, again, not coordinated or maybe so. So what does that mean for a campaign manager when you've got all these, this money on the outside? And then I wanna get you to think about whether this is a good development for democracy more generally. But so first, what does it mean from a campaign structure to have all this money on the outside? Which one of us do you want to? You first, Chris. Uh, I'll, I'll sort of bifurcate this yeah. in, in, into two levels. Um, you, you know, at the presidential level, while it's obviously a huge, having a huge impact out there as defined by that amount of money that's going into it, you know, at the presidential level, I think where you're seeing the biggest impact right now, and, and I'll put an asterisk about this because I think it's going to evolve uh, and, and, and manifest itself in different ways as we go forward, but where it really sort of shows itself in this particular election is that you can have ads like the Romney welfare ad or the ad uh, f uh, that, the, that the Obama super PAC did featuring the, 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 uh, the guy from Ohio who you know, alleged that his wife had somehow died because of the connection to, to, yeah. to, to Bain. Um, and those are ads that probably would not have necessarily run in the past because for a couple reasons. First of all, when a campaign does those types of ads and there's questions about its veracity or accuracy, that can really blow back on you. Uh, secondly, you do an ad like that, you know, your negatives pop up, uh, and there's always a battle of positives and negatives, um, and 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 so for those aspects, you really and so you sort of have almost, and this is a little bit of a flawed comparison, and it's always perilous to do a military analogy, but you know these super PACs are almost like the drones, right? It could be a guy sitting in an office, you know, in Nevada, you know, dropping a missile into a place in Afghanistan or you know, or, or Iraq when you're not really right there having to take the bullets back and the back and forth. Uh, and that's a little bit of how these sort of campaigns are being run now at the presidential level in the cycle. I, I think that it's going to change as it goes forward a little bit. To me, where the, uh, you know, the, the more sort of, uh, I think, pernicious impact right now is that you basically, because of a series of Supreme Court rulings, Buckley v. Vallejo, which said money equals speech, the Citizens United, you know, you've almost had sort of a legalization mm -hmm. of the sort of corrupting power of money you know, in, yep. in, the, in the process. And I think it's beginning to really impact how our democracy small d works, right? I mean, we have a constitution designed to forge consensus, to send people to the middle, to reward compromise. You know, the current political process, because of outside money, because of the importance of ideological groups that control that, because of safe districts, um, because that you now live in a perpetual campaign, it's like this Habesian campaign cycle, it's perpetually preparing for a campaign, right? All those aspects have created market forces which reward people going to the opposite end zones as opposed to actually trying to forge consensus compromise solutions. So you have a Dick Luger, who when I was in DC was considered a fairly conservative senator who gets thrown out of office in Indiana in a primary because he had the temerity to actually try to seek some type of solutions on things like the budget deficit, which you know, were in theory in the you know, best interest of the people of Indiana. Uh, and so I think from a small d democracy perspective, you know, I do think that this is you know, you know, troubling for, for where we are, particularly given that our country is in a global economy facing enormous challenges, you know, where ultimately, regardless of what you believe government's role should or should not be, the government does have to play some type of a leadership role. Uh, and so you've had very simple things like a gas tax, which for 50 years have been a vote that comes up on the floor, a voice vote, and it goes on, and it became a four-month fight this year. You had, obviously, you know, the fiscal cliff that people are going to be looking at. I mean, these are issues that typically would not have ever gotten to the point that they are, that I do think 
you know, are very compromising to our democracy. And just to put sort of a fine point on that, you know, if you look at some of the economic data in this country, right, to, you know, the economy slowed significantly in the second quarter of this year when a lot of private sector folks basically came to the conclusion that whoever wins, mm -hmm. you know, we are going to have brinkmanship again when it comes to what we're going to do on taxes and our deficit and actually began to retrench in terms of what they were doing from a jobs creating perspective. That's having a huge impact on all sorts of people out there who don't necessarily have a voice. And ultimately, that does reflect sort of this perversion of our democratic process. That was probably a mm -hmm. little bit no. you no. Know, more of a poli-sci or yeah. pro professorial uh, uh, Explication, but I, I do see it sort of manifest. Now, look, Hobbesian I think, is a yeah, very not that's right. Right. Well, you know, I was at Stanford, so I figured I could. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> uh, uh, but I, uh, uh, I, I don't want to be entirely pessimistic because I do think our country has gone through similar periods like this. Uh, you know, uh, Reconstruction. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, before the Progressive Era. Uh, there's been, the 20s. There have been periods when our democracy hasn't seemed to has, uh, have been working as well as it should, and we figure it out. Yeah. You know, there's a reason people are willing to climb over walls to come to this country. We still offer things that no one else in the world does. So I do think we ultimately figure it out, but I do think we're in one of those periods right now. Yeah. Mark, do you want to address the citizens? Well, any question the money? You bet. Uh, well, first of all, uh, I'm from the, I went to the University of Texas, so I have no idea what that multi-syllabic word was. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what the hell that was. But I know it's Citizens United. Uh, and I, I feel very strongly that it is a, a absolutely corrupting uh, influence in a profound, profound way on our politics. I mean, first, to your first part of your question, it creates these uh, bizarre dynamics in campaigns where uh, you have people who've been in the campaigns, uh, who've been the campaign managers who go off and start the committee who are supposed to be legally separated, but they've all been working together, working forever. So that sort of Chinese curtain is ridiculous in the first place. Uh, it's a curtain and not a wall. Um, but it also creates an odd dynamic in the campaign because campaigns should be accountable. Mm -hmm. You know, you should be accountable for the things you say and the things you do or the things that are said on your behalf. And this is a legal mandate that you not be accountable, that there's a, something out there that is not accountable and that you can't be, you know, legally you're not supposed to be accountable to this, so it happens and the president can't even disavow the damn thing. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and not only not accountable, but uh, in, in many respects it is uh, uh, unlimited money and we don't know where it's coming from. Um, so you have this, you have this, you have these, think how ridiculous this is. We have laws that say that you can only give $2,500 to a presidential candidate, but you can walk across the street, start a super PAC, and give a $10 million. Where's the, where's the sense in that? Now, what, what's the, what's, how does that really translate into, uh, what, what's the real impact? Well, the impact is that you now have uh, I was going to say this as a center right, but I think it'll be true in this in this presidential election as well. You have more money being spent by special outside interests than the candidates themselves. Mm -hmm. This is true in. I, was, I mean, I used to make this example of the last Senate race in Colorado, which is a very purple state, big Senate race, and the labor unions and the chambers, chamber of commerce, uh, and other associated interests raised like five or six times more money than the candidates running for that race. So it wasn't a race between the candidates. It was a race between the Chamber of Commerce and the labor unions. Mm -hmm. So it's becoming all special interest money. And, and, you know, you play that out and think what the ultimate impact is and how you can, you know, you could go into a state like North Dakota and you want to buy yourself a senator. It's not going to be that hard to do. Did, oh, just to add one thing, because I think this is something, again, I think about this in the context of you, the students. You know, this is the first, the last couple of years are the first time in my political, conscious political life, which you could Maybe argue Maybe we should is, back up and explain Citizens United a little bit more. Does everybody understand Citizens United? We're okay it, on that? Okay. Okay. It's Stanford, Mark, not UT. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> anyway. <Ouch. laughs> anyway. He can take it. We've been friends for a long time, trust me. Anyway. No, I think this is the thing that, 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 I, want, that, that I want young people, particularly the students, to think about. The first, the, and the word is the accountability thing that Chris said. Where truth doesn't matter at all, where fact no longer matters. What kind, no, I really mean that. What, is, what does this say? I work in the media field most of the time, so you look at the impact of, 
the, uh, 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 an online world where fact and fiction can blur, et cetera. There's issues there from an educational and other standpoint. But what, where are we in our society where fact and truth no longer have any relevance? And, and we've seen this in the last few years at a level that's never, ever, ever been taken. And we're account, where there is no accountability on this. That's a fundamental challenge to the basis of democracy. That if I were 19 years old, I'd be really pissed about thinking about I had to live with that for the next 60 or 70 years of my life. So one is the, that accountability piece. The second piece is, is in a world that, where it works like this, where money, where you can buy it like this, where you can argue that political folks will, will consciously spend most of their time at obstructing some form of compromise or consensus, which they know would be, which any sane person knows is good for the country, but because they think in a, an electoral system that's been perverted by money, they can ultimately win, so we might as well let everybody suffer for three more years, because at the end of the day, we'll get power and push our ideology. That's an unbelievable thought from a sort of a patriot, I hate to use the word, but from a sort of a, a patriotic standpoint about what's good for the country. But where you have, where you have that, to where a Dick Luger, who Chris mentioned, who I used to think of as a conservative Republican do, is thrown out because he, because he was known to compromise around big things like deficit reduction or how do we balance things like that. We, that's a very, very fundamental issue for young people. And I agree that, that with, if there is no accountability because of the, of the campaign finance system and then the broader no labels issue that Mark cares so much about, we have a very, very big cliff facing us, not just in January, but in terms of the democracy you guys are going to inherit and lead someday. I think it's a very profound issue for us to deal with as a society that, hasn't, that the politicians don't want to really talk about, but I think is very core to what's going on. Gary? I want to add two footnotes. The first is that Mark mentioned that you could go out and buy a senator. You might even actually be able to buy a president. During the Republican primary process, Hales. the Newt Gingrich candidacy was kept alive by one guy. One guy. You, you might actually affect the shape of the party platform, the positions that the candidates are taken, or maybe even nominate someone through the monies of one person. Yeah. That's crazy. Then in addition, I, I, I'm glad Indiana came up. Um, and my apologies if there's any fans in the room, but the person who displaced Dick Luger as the Republican nominee is a moron. <laughs> and no. I mean, he's like dumb as sand. Like, and, and, and the problem is that when the candidates are raising money, being dumb as sand is fatal. Like, people don't want to give to a candidate who's an idiot. They want to give to candidates they believe in or whatever. But super PACs are just about tr trying to buy an outcome, buy yourself a senator. And so Mordock is now famous for saying his idea of bipartisan compromise is Democrats accept Republican positions. That's not going to work out for him. So, so the idea that, that, that we've created this train wreck through Citizens United is absolutely in, encapsulated in the living, breathing example of Richard Mordock. Well, uh, can I just add, I wanted to add one other thing that, uh, that just testifies to the, the, the extent of the problem. The, the Koch brothers, two brothers, are expected to spend more money in this presidential campaign than the entire John McCain camp presidential campaign. Two people. Mm -hmm. All right, well, so we've been talking about the role of money. Um, we talked about polarization. Um, it's not, a, not an optimistic story we're telling here about democracy. And I guess from a local perspective, I want to add one more thing, put one more thing in the table and get your view about <clears> it. <throat> Despite the fact that there's all this money, almost none of it is being spent in California, most populous state, the most electoral votes. And in fact, the only time the candidates come to California is to treat Californians as an ATM machine to raise money for their campaign and when they head back to spend it elsewhere. Mm -hmm. um, in your view, I mean, this is of course the world you live in as a campaign strategist is the electoral college. Um, how do you assemble the number of electoral college votes you need to win? But, but for, for the record, I just dealt with the popular vote in 2000. There were other people in the campaign who did the electoral <laughs> uh -huh. college count. Oh, I love the electoral <laughs> college. Yeah. I said, I uh, love this system. Yeah. <laughs> and butterfly ballots, no doubt. Right. Sorry, we did it wrong. No, not at all. Um, it, we've got this polarization. We've got the corrupting role of money. 
Uh, we've got a primary system which pushes candidates to the, to the extremes rather than to the middle. Uh, how about the Electoral College um, arrangement itself? Uh, it, should we take that as a fixed? Is that something that is consistent with the, with the fulsome view of democracy? Because on the surface, it just seems odd that the most populous nation, uh, uh, state in the, in the nation and with the most votes never sees a dollar in political advertising at the national level. I'll defer initially to the advocate of the Electoral College. <laughs> well, I, I actually, I would love to see reforms. I mean, I, I think, I, I think it's, a, it's a crazy system where, uh, where our candidates are, are going to, you know, very uh, lightly populated areas of the country to determine the outcome of a presidential campaign. We mm -hmm. have places like Iowa and New Hampshire, which are wonderful places, but they, but they hardly reflect sort of the broader demographic of the country. So I, I, I'm, I'm, I completely support wholesale reform on that front and would be open to any sort of notions, including just a straight popular vote. Hmm. Chris? Yeah, I mean, I obviously strongly subscribe to that view of the world and, in fact, would argue if it ever happens, it'd be applied retroactively. Um, <laughs> <laughs> the Constitution notwithstanding, but, um, uh, I, I mean, I would say, right, I mean, there's, uh, we're here in California, right, um, everyone makes, you know, the, the line about it being the ATM, we get, I think, depending on every, any given year, somewhere between 60 and 80 cents back on every dollar that we send to Washington, the smallest of any of the states in the, in the country. Uh, and, and completely believe, obviously, the Electoral College does need to be changed and reformed. And there's various efforts. I'm not sure what the real chances of success are. Um, but, but California still does end up exercising influence and an impact on this campaign, you know, in ways that you may not necessarily think about. Um, I mean, first of all, it is the economic engine of the country. You know, people are talking about economic visions and economic approaches, and those ideas are coming from California and disproportionately from where, where we're sitting, right? In mm -hmm. Silicon Valley, places around here. Um, you know, secondly, California looks like what the country's gonna look like, you know, five, 10, 15 years. And so some of the cultural patterns, what's happening in politics, the types of stuff that's taking place in California, for example, the impact, I'm sure this is something you can talk about even more extensively, of the Latino vote. That is a foreshadowing of where this country is going. There was no, it wasn't just mere happenstance that the Democratic Convention was chaired by a Latino, the mayor of Los Angeles, uh, featured a keynote address by the mayor of San Antonio. Um, and you know, in and of itself, having Latinos featured that prominently impacts the national dialogue, impacts how people are viewing these issues. Um, so I do think that California ends up exercising you know, a lot more influence than necessarily purely through the electoral process. We also have the largest delegation in Congress. Mm -hmm. Um, we also, when you go through the primary process, and, and I know the Democratic one better than the Republican one, obviously, but you know, a quarter to a third of every single constituency group, the membership comes from California. Those constituency groups end up being some of the earliest primaries within the primary process. So California actually does end up exercising more influence than I think sometimes we give it credit for when you look at purely you know, through the Electoral College prison, but obviously I think the Electoral College Needs to be changed. Yeah. Let me ask. Can I ask a follow? I want to ask you guys a follow-up question related to that, and then and then a, and a more generic one about the election. So the follow-up question to that is, and and Gary, you too, but all three of you guys. If if the political system is is is, is as flawed as it is right now, and, and we can see it in in the dysfunctionality of Washington. You said last night, Mark, something you know, they, 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 they do nothing. Congress passed 900 bills. This one has passed like 100 or 115. It's an unbelievable number. The lowest. In, 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 in history. The, the Congress this year has worked 44 full, ten, full days. Yeah, if there was a value added tax, they wouldn't be paying any taxes. <laughs> <laughs> if, you're, if you run campaigns, it would be very quick with those one-liners, guys. Here's the, quite, here's the thing. If you could do one thing, one thing, to fundamentally change the process. I mean, Mark, this is an area where you know you're a major national leader. What would you do to change the process? That's question number one, and the second one is, is what would you do to change what? The, how, Just, how would you change the political? Okay. You could throw out, yeah, to the, yeah, you know, yeah. one thing. But the second one is, does anyone here believe that the public is smart enough to see this and is going to vote all, all, a, a ticket all the way, meaning Republican president, Republican Senate, Republican House, because they sort of see this dynamic and they gridlock. Does anyone believe, or that you'll get, Ob since you all think Obama is likely to win, you'll get a Republican House, I mean a Democratic House and a Democratic Senate. 
Because even though people, they're just frustrated with the dysfunctionality. So two questions. One, the number one reform you would absolutely insist upon could be the Electoral College, whatever. Second, anybody see a Democratic uh, House or Senate or a straight Republican victory across the line? So they're separate questions. Um, reform first. Yeah. Um, well, I, I think the one thing would be to overturn Citizens United. Uh, I do think through the work that organizations like No Labels is doing, we're advocating a lot of kind of process reforms that aren't ideological. They're not, they're not designed to you know, address the fiscal cliff or immigration, but, but there are so many things that are, that are jamming up the works of Congress, just to, just to name a, a couple. For example, we've proposed that there should be a 90-day up or down vote on presidential appointments. Okay? The president should be able to put people to work and put people in jobs. There are hundreds, if not thousands, of very important jobs in the federal government that today are unfulfilled. And hundreds of those in key jobs, you know, the Treasury Secretary was over there with his babysitter trying to fix the, the fiscal meltdown because he didn't have a staff. I mean, it was ridiculous. And, and I'm, I'm an example, I was appointed by President Bush to a position that had to oversee Radio Free Europe and other uh, American broadcasts around the world in a, in a time of high security and really important. I couldn't get confirmed for four years. And, uh, and, and, and there are just thousands of stories like that. So up or down vote, 90 days, filibuster reform, that's jamming up the Senate. I mean, there are, there are all kinds of things that we can do to grease the wheels and, 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 and uh, to make things work better. You know, in some ways, I, I hear what you're saying about it. It'd be great to, I almost, even though I have my own ideas about the outcome of the election, in some ways, to break the gridlock, I'd love for either party to just have the executive, have the Congress, have the Senate, to just break the jam, let it go, do everything you're going to do, and then you know, take it from there. Chris? Chris? Um, that's a great question. And, and obviously, I, to the extent that you could remove money, uh, I'm not sure if ultimately, even if you change Citizens United and Buckley v. Vallejo, whether ultimately that's realistic. It will always find its, a way to manifest itself. Uh, I'll tell you what I would do, if, and, and, and it's not particularly popular uh, with the voters. Um, uh, what I, I would make voting mandatory. If, you, if you're required to get a license drive, you're required to serve on a jury, right? Why shouldn't you as a citizen of the greatest country and the only planet that has people that we know of not be required to actually participate in a democracy? You don't have to vote for someone, right? You could just check the box, none of the above. But I think the mere fact of requiring people to vote in a democratic process uh, would have an enormously positive impact on the types of policies and how our politicians conduct themselves. Uh, and look, I'm a Democrat. I come from a progressive background. Uh, you know, from my perspective, you know, the people who have the smallest votes, voice in society you know, would be the ones who would benefit the most from a process where everyone was required to vote because their, vote, their voice would be much more augmented. Which is done in some countries. Yeah, and it's done in Australia, some places in Western Europe. Yeah, and, and, and I think you can see how it reflects in their policies. Gary? Gary. Abolish the Senate. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not kidding. Professor so, Subtle over here. I like <laughs> I know, who would have thought a professor would come out with that instead of Chris By the way, Mark? The, the, overturning Citizens United is certainly possible. The rest of it, the electoral, it's all pipe dreams because the amendment process, which requires two thirds of both chambers and three quarters of the states, which means that any 13 states can block the changing of the Constitution. And it's in the interest of the smallest states to block the abolition of the Senate. It's in the interest of mostly small states, but also a few strategically placed states to block the abolition of the Electoral College. That's so not going to happen. But the United States Senate currently awards the same level of representation to the 480,000 residents of Wyoming that it does to the 38 million residents of California. There is nothing even remotely democratic, small d, about that arrangement. And it was created at a time when the 13 colonies had been functioning effectively as independent units and we're coming together to sort of revise the Articles of Confederation in such a way that their, their interest as sovereign entities were, were still protected, um, which wouldn't have happened if you had popu just total you know, population-driven representation, because Virginia, New York, and Massachusetts Bay would have dominated uh, whatever future Congress there was at that time. We're not living with powdered wigs and wooden teeth. We do not need a second chamber. Second chambers do two really crazy things. The first is it's, it's, it's malapportioned, as I just described. So we have 
uh, voters in Wyoming having 70 times the impact on policy as a voter in California. That's not democratic. But the second thing it does is it makes it harder for voters to make the conscious decision that Jim is asking that they make, that they think through what policy set preference do I prefer, and I'm going to vote for that party. And the reason is because we have two chambers and an independently exe elected executive. So you don't, no matter who you're voting for, you don't really know what policy is going to come out of that. In a Westminster system like the United Kingdom, you elect the Tories, you know you're going to get these policies. You elect labor, you know you're going to get these policies. In the United States, because of federalism, and I, you don't know what you're going to get because, in, in fact, two-thirds of the Senate don't even change in any given election. So, so I, would, I would think about abolishing the Senate. The other thing is that the House term can't be two years. The, the idea that we elect anyone for two years so that they start campaigning the moment they're election, elected poisons the environment. How about a, or a one six-year term for the president? I, I'm with that yeah, as well. Like that. Yeah. Hey, Rob, maybe, what would yours we'll, be? Maybe we could also put in na national ballot initiatives. As someone who does ballot initiative campaigns. No. <laughs> really? We've got just well, you could, Rob, uh, Rob, uh, Rob, a, a serious, in a serious note, if right, the reality of being able to get rid of the Senate is slim to none. Good. Right? right. A, a national ballot initiative would effectively give you a no confidence vote on a series of things that would that could effectively put in place something similar to a parliamentary system if there are the right sort of parameters put around it. Or a national ballot system could give you a nationwide Prop 13 so that we bankrupt the entire country instead of just California. <laughs> <laughs> that, or, 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 that, that is true, but. But, but, but you just talked about the, the, the positives of the re direct democracy, No, no, right? I talked about the positives of representative democracy with a single chamber. Congress has to balance a budget. The state legislature has to balance a budget. The problem with direct democracy is if you were the voters of a particular state, in a single day, you could mandate doubling expenditure on the environment, education, and social services, and having the state tax rate, and you could do that. No one says you have to balance the budget as the, as the population. Bad idea. We, we've got just a couple minutes left, no, and I actually want to wind history history up our conversation here. Do you want to make a comment about what you would do or no? Uh, I, I, I want to get to this la last, okay, great. last bit. Okay. Um, this has been a far more depressing conversation <laughs> <than> the, last, <laughs> the last 30 minutes of it than I anticipated com coming it's in. Um, and because I know we have a, a room full of political junkies, um, people who care not only about the outcome of the election in November, but about the health of democracy. I wonder if you could each not only think about this one reform, but speaking to everyone here in the audience who cares about the health of the country and about democracies yeah. more generally, um, beyond working in the political process and getting in, involved, either you know, for Obama or Romney in this particular campaign, what can they do to affect some of these broader changes? If you're talking to you know, idealists and activists who want to do something, give them some marching orders about post-November how they can affect some change. Mark? Nolabels.org. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, and I'm serious about that. I mean, this is an organization that is committed to uh, bipartisan problem solving, where we've uh, come out with uh, a, a whole list of reforms, that uh, co uh, congressional slate of reforms, a bunch of reforms for the, the executive branch. We have 600,000 uh, members across the country, many of them in California. Uh, and it's getting a lot of traction. It's getting a lot of credibility inside the Beltway. And it's serving as a catalyst to bring members of the opposite party together uh, uh, to work for solutions at a time when, uh, when we have so many challenges ahead of us. So uh, that, that's, that's and, and uh, it, as I said, it's, 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 it's growing quickly. Lots of organizations like this are popping up. Uh, I think that ultimately democracy is a marketplace, and ultimately the marketplace responds to voters. And, and we're seeing enormous appetite among real voters for, uh, for, for members of parties to come together and work out solutions uh, because the problems are just so great. Uh, additionally, I'd say that I, I'm seeing a, uh, a, a fabulous response from people who are going around the system. And the, what I love about the generation that I see is that that while there's a level of cynicism about the political institutions that are familiar, and we've seen a drop off in trust for government, drop, a drop off in trust for the parties, growth in independent voters, that people maintain an appetite and a commitment for change. And they're just doing it in different ways. They're doing it through NGOs mm -hmm. and civic participation. Yeah. And they're finding more meaningful ways in the private and entrepreneurial sec sector 
to embrace and, and create innovation and change. Chris, that's great. Um, you know, I'll sort of back into this a little bit, which is saw a really interesting statistic uh, done by some poli sci sociologist that looked at the 1976 election, which was a very close, you know, basically a one point election. And, you know, at that time, well over half of the country lived in voting precincts that mirrored, you know, where the national election was. So uh, living in what we would today call purple precincts, right? Um, if you look at 2000, 2004, 2008, a little bit less, but, but still fairly close, I suspect 2012, you know, less than 25% you know, of the country lived or lives in voting precincts that reflected what were very, very close elections. In fact, lived in the vast majority of the country lived in voting precincts, which would have been landslide, you know, vast margin one way or the other. Uh, and you know, the polarization that exists out there, um, you, you know, you have a Fox world, you have an MSNBC world, but at the end of the day, you know, like I said, I'm still an optimist. You know, I do think that people still are Americans. They believe in what's unique about this country, what's great about this country. I actually think, and I think this is what No Labels is getting at, is that most people are pretty close somewhere in the 45, 48 yard line and you sit them down and you put them in a room and they'd be able to come up with pretty good solutions uh, that would make Argue. sense for the country. And so I guess my long-winded suggestion is, um, you know, if you're from the left, you know, spend a little bit of time, you know, reading what's on the right or watching what's on, you know, right-leaning TV channels uh, just to get a sense of how folks are thinking. And if you're on the right, you know, do the same on the left. Uh, but ultimately, you know, I, our political leaders are called leaders, but very rarely do they actually lead. They follow the public, right? Mm -hmm. It's ultimately up to us, you know, people in this room, people around the country, to provide the impetus so that you get the type of leadership that you want. I think that's ultimately beginning to sort of address some of the polarization that address, lives in our society. Gary. How many of the students in the room know Michael Tubbs? Holy crap. Um, <laughs> Michael Tubbs is running for the Stockton City Council. Probably many fewer of you know Ray Saldana, who graduated in 2008, um, member of the Stanford College World Series championship team, and is now a member of the City Council of San Antonio, Texas. Um, they, did, they got Stanford degrees, but be prepared for this. They did not go into investment banking, and they did not work for Facebook. <laughs> don't go into investment banking and don't work for Facebook. <laughs> go out there and do something that you actually give a damn about. And don't tell me you give a damn about whether there's an unlike button next to the like button. <laughs> go out there, go out there and do something. And I don't care if you're on the left or the right, but it turns out that when smart people get involved in government, they do better things. They do better things, whether they're from the left or the right. So um, follow Michael Tubbs, follow Ray Saldana, and don't go into investment banking or Google. Hey, Rob, it, it, you know, it's interesting when he asked this question, and, it, I was, I was, and I was asking you what your thought was. So Tubbs, my TA, thank you very much for it. And by the way, you should all send Michael Tubbs money because he is, I, I'm allowed to say, I'm allowed to say this in electioneering. Michael Tubbs needs money. He's running for the Stockton City Council, and everybody can send him $10 and help him get elected. There's no longer the equal time provision, so that's good. That's correct. And by the way, but, but, I, can, let me interject that Michael Tubbs is running to join the City Council of a bankrupt city. Correct. So he's not running because he sees this as the first step to the presidency. He's running because he's from Stockton, and he wants to change the town correct. he grew up in. But, but the biggest thing I was going to say, it's interesting that we all ended up in the same place, because this is what I was thinking. And was sort of, that was why I was sort of asking Rob that question earlier. I actually think that the key to this, because I agree that it got a little depressing there when you're looking at all the problems we have, because they are pretty big right now. I actually think the key is sitting in this room, because I really do believe, I actually, that, and it's the one thing that frustrated me about the Occupy stuff. Because what I felt was, is that whatever your position is, wherever you are in the political spectrum, if young people would speak out in a loud way, on a continuous way, over the next few years, you would fundamentally change the system. It is the one voice that is not, it has been heard in the NGO world. It has be heard, been heard incredibly in, in, in creative entrepreneurship here and around the country. But it is the one voice that I think will would change everything. And if young people would demand change, it would change because old people would be ashamed of the situation that we've allowed to happen. I'm really serious. And I think I, I would put it on that because that's what this class is about, which is 
how do we take, what are we going to do with our 2012 election? David Kennedy is going to give you an amazing historical perspective on how we got from probably 1800 to 2012 in an hour and a half next week. But I think the big thing for everyone, and I say this because we're going to integrate, I'm with Rahane, I'm, with, I'm can, for integration. You can mingle with your elders. We're going to mingle with the elders. <laughs> but I'm not looking at the elders as the solution. I'm looking at you guys as the solution, but as a loud, persistent, and in most cases, a collective voice. Because I think this will change. I actually am very optimistic it will change, but I think the change is going to come from you. Rob. This has been a great start to our class, so please join me in thanking our guests. All right. For more, please visit us at stanford.edu.